the science fiction anti-capitalist manifesto of my dreams. All right, I gotta be out of here in an hour, so let's see how fast of a video I can film. Hello, folks. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I'm going to be filming what is very much hopefully a very quick video because this vi weekend has been very busy, but the algorithm is merciless. I am going to be just going over all of the books that are on my TBR for now, between now and the end of the year, the end of 2022. Starting with a um, book I have just started currently reading, The Omnivore's Dilemma, A Natural History of Four Meals by Michael Pollan. Pollan? Pollan? P... O L L A N. Um, I've just started it and so far it's very interesting. I'm definitely going to enjoy reading this. Um, th there is no audiobook for this. <laughs> I definitely prefer to consume my nonfiction via audiobook. Um, there is an audiobook for like the young, young readers edition. I mean, maybe there's an audiobook that's like Audible exclusive, but I do not have Audible, so. Um, I'm definitely gonna read it because the content is interesting, um, but it's slow going. Like I've been reading it a few, a few pages before I go to bed at night, and when I say a few, I mean like three pages at the time. So there's that. Uh, then we've got the last three books on my Amnesia Reads TBR. I'm hoping to get through these hopefully well before the end of the year because there's only three of them left. Um, I know this one will be a quick read. This is Cart and Quitter, book one of the Dale Mark Quartet by Diana Wynne-Jones. I need to reread the Diana Wynne-Jones that I own because I in remember enjoying them. I really don't remember anything that happened. I need to, that's the premise of the Amnesia Reads TBR. I will have that video linked in the description box below if you would like to know more about it and know what else was on that list. Um, all right, then we've got Georges by Alexandre Dumas. The story of a wealthy mulatto boy who is driven from his island home by racist landowners. Returning to Mauritius as an accomplished young man, Georges pitches strength against a powerful plantation owner, leading a dramatic slave uprising and claiming the heart of a beautiful white woman. Which, I mean, for the time it was written, I think it's exciting. Um, great. Uh, and then, will I actually read this whole thing, or I at least need to give it a shot? This is Global Human Smuggling. Um, which is a, a book that I had kept from a class in college and I remember reading it and remember finding the content of some of these books interesting, um, but I have no idea how readable or how academic this is. Um, I'm going to definitely try to give this a shot during Nonfiction November because I feel like this would definitely fit the prompt of Borders. I don't think any of the other nonfiction I have on deck easily fits prompts, but this one does. So I'll definitely at least be giving it a shot. Great. And then I've got this lovely stack. Um, these are what's left of all of the books that I purchased in 2021, um, plus some ebooks that I'll get to. So rapid fire. We've got The Lightning Thief by, by Rick Riordan. I've never read any of his works, so I have to get to that. Um, the Planets by Dava Deva Sobel. I did start the audiobook for this, but I quickly realized that I was in... I needed to, like, uh, immersion read it, where, like, I listened to it and read it, and I just wasn't in... The things, whatever was going on in my life, I didn't really have time to do that. No critique of this, I just... Um, I had picked it up and I wasn't really in the right headspace for this at the time, so need to give it another shot. The Master Butcher Singing Club. I purchased this in January of 2021. I think this might be the last, the oldest book from the last calendar year. This is definitely a book I'm going to attempt to read for uh, Indigathon, which also happens in November. I have not seen an announcement go out for that and um, given some things that I know have happened in the personal lives of the people who tend to run it. I don't know if it's going to officially happen this year. Hopefully it does happen in some capacity, um, but regardless, I will be reading some Indigenous 
I will be making a point to read some Indigenous literature in the month of November. Should be reading it all year round anyway, but absolutely in November. Then we've got All Systems Red by Martha Wells, the first little novella in the Murderbot series. It's just like a, a booktube favorite. It sounded interesting. I found it in a used bookstore. This will be a quick one to get through. We've got a short story collection, Young Warriors Stories of Strength, edited by Tamora Pierce and Josepha Sherman. So I bought this because I was, tr I, uh, with this, I feel like I have, I now own every literary thing that Tamora Pierce has touched except one graphic novel. Um, I didn't realize that it was not a collection of Tamora Pierce stories. Um, it's mostly other authors. Does Tamora Pierce have a story in here? Yes, she does have a story in here, but it's mostly um, all other authors, uh, including one by Holly Black is the only other author that I recognize. Then we've got uh, the last book from when I was going to Little Free Libraries frequently. This is The Talented Mr. Ripley by Patricia Highsmith. Uh, I fucking love the movie. I think it, I think the performances of both Matt Damon and Jude Law are criminally underrated. But anyway, um, I've also uh, heard from watching um, Jen Campbell. I've been mentioning her a lot recently. She is an author. She is also a creator here on YouTube. She mostly talks about books. Um, she also talks about um, her disability and how that identity um, interacts with her presence on YouTube, with the kind of books she reads, with the kind of books she writes. Anyway, she's great. She's great. Um, but she, I think, read this and then fell in love with Patricia Highsmith and read a whole bunch of her other books. So I'm excited for this to be in my near reading future. Uh, then we've got Autonomous by Anna Lee Newitz. I always forget the premise of this. I, f I found it in a used bookstore and it was just like a day where I'm like, I'm just gonna go and buy like 10 books. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go and it's gonna be great. And it was a really great haul. Um, but anyway, I keep forgetting the premise of this and then I read it and I'm like, oh fuck, fuck yeah, that sounds great. Okay, here we go. Um, Earth 2144, Jack is an anti-patent scientist turned drug pirate, traversing the world in a submarine as a pharmaceutical Robin Hood, fabricating cheap scripts for poor people who can't otherwise afford them. But her latest drug hack has left a trail of lethal overdoses as people become addicted to their work, doing repetitive tasks until they become unsafe or insane. Hot on her trail, an unlikely pair, Elias, a brooding military agent, and his robotic partner, Paladin. As they race to stop information about the sinister origin of Jack's drug from getting out, they begin to form an uncommonly close bond that neither of them fully understand. And underlying it all is one fundamental question. Is freedom possible in a culture where everything, even people, can be owned? Mmm, this sounds like the science fiction anti-capitalist manifesto of my dreams. So excited for this. Um, okay, so next we have one of the books on here that if I don't get around to reading it, it's more about having it for whenever I get around to reading it, even if that's not soon. That's Paradise Lost by John Milton. This is very much the type of classic that I usually have no interest in, except, supposedly, His Dark Materials very closely follows the story arc of Paradise Lost, which, yes, okay, Eve and the Apple and the fall of great, the you know, the man's fall of grace and expulsion from the garden. Okay, overarching themes, sure. Um, but given that that, that His Dark Materials, the Golden, the Golden Compass series, is one of my favorite fantasy series of all time, um, it does feel appropriate that this is something I would attempt to read. Um, so, but I know I, de I definitely need to be in a very, like, scholarly mindset, which sure as hell isn't happening this month, I know. Um, so this might be something that it might be unread and go onto my shelf of, like, fantasy, folklore, classic poem kind of category. 
um, and just and I will just kind of have it for whenever whenever the time is right. Okay, next we've got a couple of interesting um, nonfiction. We've got The Genius of Birds by Jennifer Ackerman. Um, this is definitely a book I want to read to see if my dad will like it. Hopefully he doesn't watch this video before Christmas. I don't think he will. Just in case anyone, any other family member or anyone who knows my dad watches this, shush, shush. <laughs> um, he's really into birds, um, especially like the native birds in his backyard. You know, he's retired, he needs a hobby. Um, but yeah, this is kind of about like birds and the intelligence of birds and um, this and this next one were books that I picked up after reading Braiding Sweetgrass and I was just really in the mood for more um, investigative, uh, kind of like gentle nature nonfiction, like nonfiction that's not just like hard hitting anti-capitalist, -cap anti anti-racist truths. Like, yes, I do need that too, but sometimes you need something that's a little, you know, interesting, still relevant to taking care of our world, but not, not so personally fraught. So this is one of the ones I picked up. Um, and then I also picked up Why Fish Don't Exist, which is a fucking gorgeous cover design. Um, a Story of Law, Loss, Love, and the Hidden Order of Life by Lulu Miller. Why Fish Don't Exist is a dark and astonishing tale of love, scientific obsession, chaos, and possibly even murder. Actually reading this again, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm invigorated about this story. Uh, David Starr Jordan was a taxonomist, a man possessed with bringing order to the natural world. In time, he would be credited with discovering nearly a fifth of the fish known to humans in his day. But the more of the hidden blueprint of life he uncovered, the harder the universe seemed to try to thwart him. His specimen collections were demolished by lightning, by fire, and eventually by the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which sent more than a thousand of his discoveries housed in fragile glass jars plummeting to the floor. In an instant, his life's work was shattered. Many might have given up, given into despair, but Jordan, he surveyed the wreckage at his feet, found the first fish he recognized, and confidently began to rebuild his collection. And this time, he introduced one clever innovation that he believed would at last protect his work against the chaos of the world. When NPR reporter Lulu Miller first heard this anecdote in passing, she took Jordan for a fool, a cautionary tale in hubris or denial. But as her own life slowly unraveled, she began to wonder about him. Perhaps instead he was a model for how to go on when all seemed lost. What she would unearth about his life would transform her understanding of history, morality, and the world beneath her feet. Part biography, part memoir, part scientific adventure, why fish doesn't, don't exist, reads like a fable about how to persevere in a world where chaos will always prevail. Feels relevant. Feels relevant. Okay. Okay, and then I do have a couple of ebooks that I acquired last year. Uh, we've got Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? Um, I don't have the author's name right in front of me, but there will be a lovely picture on the screen. And I will have um, titles and authors in the description box below as well if you want to reference them. Um, this is a book that I kind of bought on accident. Um, I think this was the first time I ever used the Amazon Kindle one-click purchase that is sometimes assigned to their books and you can't, it's literally the only way you can buy it. And I discovered, yes, one-click is definitely completing a purchase. Um, maybe it was I didn't buy it by accident, but I didn't know how to apply my Amazon points to an ebook purchase. So I actually like paid for it when I meant to pay with it with, with points. That seems more likely. Anyway. It's on my list. Um, thank God for my written down list because I have learned that ebooks are not a good purchase investment for me because they are out of sight, out of mind. The exceptions being romance books that I read immediately. Um, and uh, we'll get into it, but um, e-arcs because they tend to have some kind of like due date or expiration date and that is super motivating. That's good for me. Okay, the other ebook is something I got in a Goodreads giveaway. This is a matter of scale. I don't remember exactly what this is about. This is something about like climate change and our energy consumption, our electricity consumption. And I remember I started reading it and found it very technical and kind of like with what happened with the planets. Um, I just realized this wasn't really the right time. I need I need more time to sit down and read it 
you know, not read it in 15 minute increments on my breaks at work. I needed to sit down for like an hour to two hours, two hour chunks. Um, let's see. Speaking of arcs. All right. So, uh, this is getting archived November 1st. I just got approved for it. So I had to kick butt and read book one, which is the keeper of night. Um, which I will talk about in my October wrap up, but spoiler, I fucking enjoyed it and I'm excited for book two. Book two is The Empress of Time by, uh, Kylie Lee Baker. Um, I think this was published October 4th, so this is a brand new release. Um, and then I also, uh, want to try to get to Valley of Shadows. Uh, this is, this was published in September. It doesn't have an archive due date, thankfully. This was something I kind of hoped to uh, get to for um, Latin American Latinx book bingo. Um, I just didn't have time to get to it. Let's see. Discrimination is evil, but evil does not discriminate. 1883, West Texas. In the vast desert, a gleaming river snakes beneath the blinding sun. When the Rio Grande shifts course, the Mexican city of Olvido is stranded on the northern side of the new border between the United States and Mexico. When a series of mysterious and horrific crimes grip the divided border town, a reclusive former Mexican lawman is lured out of retirement to restore order and save the lives of a growing number of abducted children. In the face of skeptics and hostile Anglo settlers, the war weary Charo Solitario Cisneros struggles to overcome not only the evil forces that threaten his town, but also his own inner demons. He is burdened by the turbulent darkness of a mystical curse that has guided his lonely destiny until Onawa, a gifted and beautiful Apache Mexican seer, joins his mission and dares him to change the course of both their lives. Through luminous prose and introspective meditations, Ruiz sweeps readers away on a journey to another time and a remote place where the universally compelling forces of good and evil dance amidst the shadows of magic and mountains. Magical realism dark western? Which, I mean, the western genre does need more non-white authors throwing their hat in the mix. Um, and the cover is lovely. To, that's probably what caused me to click on it in the net gallery, gallery was, that's pretty. What's that about? Hmm, okay, okay. Um, okay, and then some other hopefuls, because I have a goal to read, like, some translated fiction, which I know I've been slacking on, and to read, like, a couple of books in Spanish just to not lose too much proficiency. So I'll throw into the pile um stories from mexico historias de mexico um this is like both like in english and in spanish like a like a reading workbook that is like um mythology and folklore tales so this should be fairly easy reading some of the stories are a paragraph um but uh yeah we'll give this a shot see if i can read this before the end of the year and then for translated fiction, I mean, my easiest options are going to be continuing on with the Witcher novels. These are translated from Polish? Yes, he's from Poland. Um, I know I've got the audiobook for, see, this is book two, The Time of Contempt. I know I've got this on, on hold at the library. I think it should be coming available pretty soon. So I'll at least try to get to book two before the end of the year, if I have time. I'll get to book three, Baptism of, I'll get to book three, Baptism of Fire, um, and then if we're really doing well, um, I will continue on in, um, oh, I don't know what the series is called, but book two is The Alchemist of Shadow, The Alchemist in the Shadows by Pierre Pavel. This is translated from the French, and this is, uh, Three Musketeers with Dragons. That's really the best way to explain it. Um, I think there's even like some characters in book one that maybe are like named the same. Um, I mean, it's not like the most amazing fantasy I've ever read, but the sword fight, the description of the sword fights are really cool. And maybe that's because I've had some like sword fight stage combat training ages and ages ago. <laughs> um, but I could picture this, I could picture the combat scenes really well. 
but uh, this is also a world where I had to, it doesn't have a um, character glossary, so I had to make my own because I was having trouble keeping track of who the fuck is everybody. So I'm glad I have that bookmark somewhere, I think, in my other, in the book one. Book one is The Cardinal's Blades. I enjoyed book one enough that I purchased secondhand copies of book two and three because my library did not have them. Um, otherwise it would have been a library borrow. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll finish out the series. Mostly, I'm more interested in them because they are translated fantasy, but fuck, whatever, whatever, it all counts. It counts. It counts. Anything else that I'm really trying to prioritize? Oh, I guess I'd like to try to get to Panama Red. This is a, a another book. I mean, that's the book that I acquired this calendar year uh, from another Goodreads giveaway. But this is a book that I um, applied for the giveaway because it sounded like something my father-in-law would like. And he's the kind of person who reads like the same three authors over and over again. Um, and it's his genre is... Um, like military action espionage so like the born identity jack reacher you know those authors he will just kind of read i mean they have a huge backlist but he kind of reads the same old white guys over and over again um so i've been desperately trying to find either a woman or a person of color author in that genre but not but not centering police officers. That's the trick because he's he's former law enforcement and he picks that apart too much. So like military is like close enough, but not so much that he picks it apart like with the police stuff. So I've been desperately trying to find women or person of color authors who have written something in that genre. If you have any suggestions, please, please. Um, beyond that, it's kind of like, all right, can I just suggest an author he has not read before? Let's, let's start there. <laughs> let's start there. Um, and I think part of that is actually me reading some of these books as well. Um, there was a book I got him for Christmas a couple years ago that I went back and read it and I was like, mm, I mean, it's good, but it's, it's less James Bond and more... John Le Carré, Tinker Tailor, Soldier Spy, which is a little bit too, too elegant. That's the list. That's the video. <sighs> I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I am sorry that I was talking so fast in this video. Um, you, if you need to, you can slow down how fast the videos are played. I would not be offended if you need to do that. I will have my social media and all the other places where you can find me in the description box below. Um, if you've made it to the end of the video, uh, leave me a dragon or a sword emoji. I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye!